And this famously goes back to the ancient historian Morton Smith, who was writing in the 1970s this bestseller called Jesus the Magician. And that was basically his argument that we may as well think of Jesus as a magician, that the Gospels portray him as a miracle worker going around doing supernatural feats of wonder. I don't agree with him per se. But if we think of the historical Jesus as potentially someone who postured or positioned himself as someone who does, you know, exorcisms, for example. I mean, you could look up on YouTube right now, you know, exorcist, and there are Christian preachers in the U.S. right now who, who do exorcisms on stage. You know, you can believe in the reality of demons or not, but they are doing a ritual, a performative ritual that we call an exorcism. And it's very believable that a, a an itinerant charismatic preacher in the first century Galilee could have been doing something like that. Now, the real question, though, is like, do we call that magic? Roughly around the time of Jesus or Josephus or people quite uh, just a little bit before, we actually get a lot of narratives about uh, or several narratives about other miracle working Galileans specifically. Uh, these are people referred to as uh, Anshe Ma'ased, doers of deeds. And, and I think that one of the questions is, is, should we call Jesus a magician? That's one question. The other question is, would there have been an already existing indigenous, Jewish, maybe even Galilean category that other Jews of the time would have recognized Jesus as? Jesus, when you study him in the context of these other Jewish miracle workers, these other Anshe Ma'ased, he becomes very normal. It's like, oh yeah, he's like Choni the Circle Maker, or Hanina Bendoza, or Shimon Bar Yochai. And, and people ascribing miraculous you know, thaumaturgical power to their their heroes is nothing special, is nothing, nothing surprising. You know, like Justin said, we see that happening today. You know, the Roman Catholic Church is still canonizing saints, and a lot of that means identifying them doing miracles. So this is happening here in the 21st century. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm with two of my uh, people who I really look up to and watch, and uh, pay, I'm a patron of both of you. And I look at, I watch your videos, and it, I'm, I'm inspired by you guys from the videos that you put out, and I really enjoy your content. And it's, this is a, this is a big deal to have both you guys here. We have Dr. Justin Sledge from Esoterica, and we have Dr. Andrew Henry from Religion for Breakfast. And the topic is Jesus as a magician. And people might be saying, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, some of the early art going back to the third century depicts Jesus holding a wand in his hand, looking like a magician. And I don't know, there might be some some ways we can translate that or, or how we can, uh, what does this mean, Jesus as a magician? And we could start with you, Dr. Henry. What do you think about that? Sure. I mean, this famously goes back to the ancient historian Morton Smith, who was writing in the 1970s this bestseller called Jesus the Magician. And that was basically his argument that we may as well think of Jesus as a magician. The, the Gospels portray him as a miracle worker going around doing supernatural feats of wonder. And he draws this analogy to a conception of a, you know, an itinerant uh magic worker basically and he he makes an argument that jesus must have been trained in some form of magical practice so this opens up a huge can of worms so in in religious studies we talk about theory and we talk about method so theory is being really precise about the terminology that we use and being able to defend the terms that you use so when i say ritual when i say magic when i say sacred when i say magician what do I mean? So that's being really good with your theory. And method is just being good with the, the methods that you use to study your data. So whether that's archaeological methodology as you study material culture, or is it, you know, literary historical methodology as you study texts. And I've always thought that Morton Smith is a little bit sloppy with both his theory and his method. He doesn't really quite define what he means by magician. And then he uses texts that I don't think apply to a, a first century Jewish apocalyptic prophet like Jesus. So I'll, I'll, I'll lay that out first as a caveat that Morton Smith, I don't agree with him per se. But if we think of the historical Jesus as potentially someone who postured or positioned himself as someone who does you know, exorcisms, for example, I mean, you could look up on YouTube right now, 
you know, exorcist. And there are Christian preachers in the U.S. right now who, who do exorcisms on stage. You know, you can believe in the reality of demons or not, but they are doing a ritual, a performative ritual that we call an exorcism. And it's very believable that a, a an itinerant, charismatic preacher in the first century Galilee could have been doing something like that. Now, the real question, though, is like, do we call that magic? And so much of exorcistic practice does seem magical in the sense that people often try to define it, you know, using paraphernalia like amulets or uh, uh, you know, formula like potions, if we're going to use that term. Uh, but some of it's much more literary. I mean, the Dead Sea Scrolls have a few exorcistic formula that are basically like psalms, like they're literary poetry. So mm -hmm. there's this whole gamut of what we can call exorcism, whether it's something that a non-literate specialist can do or a very well-trained Jewish rabbi could do. Interesting. Dr. Sledge, what do you think about that? I, I think that's, uh, I think uh, Andrew is exactly right. And I, I guess what I would only, uh, I would only put forward in addition to that is that one of the things I think that Morton Smith text also does poorly, and I think this is sort of also just true in general, is that Jesus was a Galilean Jewish person. And if we want to really get into that world, we should look at other Galilean Jewish people. And what turns out is that if you study texts like the Mishnah and, and other texts around, you know, roughly around the time of Jesus or Josephus or people quite uh, just a little bit before, we actually get a lot of narratives about uh, or several narratives about other miracle working Galileans specifically. Uh, these are people referred to as uh, Anshe Ma'ased, doers of deeds. And this, this term Anshe Ma'ased uh, has a connotation of, of uh, miraculous or supernatural deeds. So magician or goes or a similar kind of Greek term really puts Jesus into a specifically Hellenic Greek context of which that's not totally inaccurate in the world that Jesus lived in. But also there was an indigenous uh, category for people who did things like exorcisms, who, who did things like miraculous, um, other kind of miraculous powers like causing it to rain or stopping it to rain or dealing with demons or what have you, that there was an indigenous term for that. And I think that one of the questions is, is, should we call Jesus a magician? That's one question. The other question is, would there have been an already existing indigenous Jewish, maybe even Galilean category that other Jews of the time would have recognized Jesus as? And this is one of the arguments I often have against uh, the mythicist, is that uh, mythicism makes Jesus out to be a very singular character, uh, or a character very much built into Hellenic thought, where he's sort of downstream of all these Hellenic ideas. But the truth of the matter, I think, is he's actually very at home among similar kinds of Jewish miracle workers. And G G Jesus, when you study him in the context of these other Jewish miracle workers, these other Anshe Ma'aseb, he becomes very normal. It's like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, he's like Choni the Circle Maker, or Chanina Bendoza, or Shimon Bar Yochai. He looks kind of like them. And then he's like, oh, there were 15 of these guys. We know about four or five of them, but this must have been a, this was, this was a social category. So I would also say that when we ask a question of whether Jesus was a magician, we should be asking another question is, to what degree can we fit him into already existing Jewish uh, ideas that existed uh, at the time? So that would be my, um, my counter argument, kind of counter argument, but a, a way of rephrasing the question um, to say, maybe there are already Jewish categories that we have that Christian scholars dismiss because some Christian scholars don't really read Jewish text very well. So uh, if, I, if I'm hearing you both right, this is basically, it comes down to linguistics and how we define magic. Whereas people might see magic today is like a guy with a hat and a wand and, and, a, and, a, and a bunny jumps out. Whereas magic is more of the intent and ritual does that make sense? Or is, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's one hundred percent a semantic dodge. Like, I don't think we're trying to dodge the question. I think I want to use the a term that Justin just used, which is social category. I'll just use the term job title. Like, magician is a very squishy job title. Like, is anybody calling themselves a magician in, in antiquity? Like, the term itself comes from magos or magos, mm -hmm. like a a literal Persian functionary in the Persian Empire that is then kind of adopted into the Greek language. And magia or magia, the Greek word that we eventually get the English word magic, is stuff that magi do. 
And stuff that Magi did was probably just priestly functions, you know, sacrifices, maybe leading some sort of Persian liturgy. Uh, but as it goes on in Greek and Roman thought, it kind of takes on these kind of spooky terms like, oh, well, they did human sacrifice or they did, you know, dream interpretations. And so the, the word starts getting very squishy. And critics of Jesus called him a magos, like called him a, as someone who practices magia. So specifically Celsus, who's a Greek philosopher that the Christian theologian origin uh, refutes in this text called Against Celsus. Celsus explicitly says, oh, Jesus was doing magia. He went to Egypt and learned all these uh, weird, spooky, demonic things. Then he came back to, to Judea and then did this, this other stuff. But I mean, we're kind of we're kind of seeing what Celsus is doing. Like he's he's applying a term to what he sees, which is you know just to use a really neutral term, thaumaturgy, which just means wonder working. He's he's reading the same stuff in the Gospels, and he calls it magia, while Origen reads the exact same stuff and calls it like the divine power of God. So it's it's a complete wow. value judgment. Yeah. So when I'm saying so, what's the job title of someone who does magic in antiquity? Well, the job title is usually rabbi or priest or monk. You know, when you look at early Christian magic, the people that were doing magic insofar as making amulets, exercising demons, creating healing, uh, you know, applications, healing formulas, they were monks and priests and bishops. They were scribes. Some of them might have been like a, a root worker that lives on the fringes of society, but none of it is like the sort of folkloric character that is um, conjured when you use the word magician, like Harry Potter or Gandalf. So when we say Jesus was a magician, I'm, I want us to think very carefully about the social role that he played in first century Galilee. And the social role would have been potentially exorcist. And what that, what does, the, what did the actual exorcisms look like? You know, I'm not sure. Was it more literary like the Dead Sea Scrolls? Was it more just char charismatic preacher like we see on YouTube saying, come out. Um, but you know, it doesn't necessarily require a great deal of, education or literary skill to to do a performative ritual like that but it's a specific social category and when we use the word magic or magician is that helping us understand the social context more or is it hindering i think it hinders and in fact i don't i often don't use the word magic i was like let's just use terms like healing protecting exercising cursing like actual actions that these rituals are meant to be doing i see your point um I have some, I have a question for Dr. Sledge, but if you have anything to add to that, go go please please do. Yeah, I, I guess I would, the only thing I would add, and I think Andrew uh, said it said it very well, is that terms like magic or superstition is another great enthusiasm was another great one in the 17th century. They're all othering terms. They're all ways of describing what other people do that you don't like. We do religion correctly, they do superstition. We do thaumaturgy, they do magia. We do this, they do goitzia, right? the term magician is almost always functioning as a, as an othering term. And so insofar as it's an othering term, or in the case of Celsus, a, po a polemical term, we should just be skeptical of using it as academics. It, it comes with so much baggage. It comes with so much, uh, with so much uh, stuff. And unless Jesus comes out in the, you know, the text somewhere and says, you know, ego, Amy, Magea, da, 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 I do, I'm a magician or whatever, which you would never do. We shouldn't, we shouldn't take, you know, these categories can, uh, they can, they can obscure rather than clarify. And I think that magic magician, um, uh, which again, like we have the Aramaic and the Hebrew terms for that, right? It, you know, if, if someone referred to Jesus as someone who, who engages in kishuf, that's a really technical, uh, word for prohibited supernatural, supernatural, activity uh, in Jewish law. That's the kind of thing they'd have been talking about at the time of Jesus's lifetime. We never see him being accused of that in the gospels. Um, the most we get is sort of, he drives out demons by using other demons, which was a common technique for driving out demons in the ancient Near East. Um, but we don't, we don't see him ever called that in the text. And if, uh, and if, if Christian early, Christ, early members of the Jesus movement or Jesus were, were called things like that, I suspect, right? We, we would have gotten some hint of it. So again, I, I'm, 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 Jesus comes from a very specific historical context and the language of, of magic was also a technological language. It was a very, uh, it was a technical language. And had they had that language been at play, I think we would have had some evidence of it. It's interesting that it's Celsus that comes back later and accuses Jesus of this. We don't see the, uh, 
uh, the we never see the rabbis refer to Jesus or I don't know Machashef or something. Um, so that would be what I would add. It, it's just that, um, yeah, let's let's try to stay close to the language of the day and the social categories of the day, as opposed to taking inherently polemical terms like pagan or magician, and then applying them to to people uh, willy nilly. I don't yeah. know that it's a. I don't know that it clarifies much. And going off of that, like to use the indigenous terms, like there's always going to be slippage between the Greek, the Aramaic, the Hebrew, the Latin, and the the modern English terms. So we say magia in Greek and magic in English, but there's slippage between those two terms. So it's the 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 art or the practice of the magi. It's a term that can be used, you know, ostensibly ethnographically or anthropologically. Like Herodotus is trying to explain what what the magi do over in Persia, and so he uses the term magia. And then Celsus is using the term polemically. He's not talking about Persian religious right. functionaries. He's talking about this Jewish Galilean guy who he thought he was crazy Good and point. demonic demon possessed so he uses this term so this term has major slippage from when we say magic and when we say magic we might be talking about stagecraft like chris angel or some sort of illusionist um or we could be using it in a folkloric sense like harry potter or we might be using it in a polemic sense like if a fundamentalist christian says like oh don't go play with pokemon cards because that's magic so <laughs> again there's slippage and i when when doing this sort of work i insist at least in my my own research to use the indigenous terms. We use magia, we use pharmakia, which might refer to like, uh, you, you, see, you hear the word pharmacy in there, but it can sometimes mean like magic in general, but it could also mean like substance-based magic, whether it's using roots or herbs or uh, substances of something, some sort. You have goetia, uh, you have the, the Latin word maleficium, and all these terms have different semantic valences. Like it's just not all magic. So part of my whole job <laughs> is to demystify what we call magic. Like when we hear the word, we think of mystical things, but imagine just a really basic thing, the social warfare of antiquity. Someone just stole your hoodie from the bathhouse and you're pissed at them. So you go curse them with a curse tablet. You know, it's right. very just on the ground mundane stuff. Your, your, your five-year-old kid is, is becoming dehydrated from dysentery and you're freaking out what do you do you go to the local monk and say hey give me something for my poor kid and he makes you an amulet that says you know dysentery demon get out of you and you put it on your kid like it's just really mundane down to earth coping with social crises and to call that magic i think we just lose so much and so right. i can imagine a person like jesus or honey the circle maker functioning in the same social role hey i'm the charismatic dude in town that can help you with your migraine headache come to me let me do it and it's all it's just on the ground social uh dealing with social crises yeah. in think... addition to the greek there you know there are more than a half a dozen technical words for 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 magic magic in hebrew um and again the, the rabbis are very pic particular particular about them because some of them carry the death penalty if you're caught pun caught doing them and some of them are, are not at all uh, criminally punishable. A lot of debates about that as a time, at, at the time of Jesus about what was listed and what was not. And so when we use a, a blunt a blunt word like magic to cover over all of them, we're losing all those technical distinctions that would have been um, very much alive in, 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 in Jesus' day. Yeah, and to, to, to bring this full circle back to Morton Smith, so I said he was sloppy with his theory because he was not defining what he means by magic or magician, but he's also sloppy with his method because one of the main things he does throughout that book is use texts from late antique Egypt that we frequently call the Greek magical, magical papyri and try to use those texts to make sense of the miracles that we see in the Gospels. And one of the, the striking moments he does this is to try to explain the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist as a magical ritual. He says, hey, look, so John the Baptist baptizes Jesus and then a dove come down, comes down from heaven. Hey, look, there's a parallel thing in the Greek magical, magical papyri where mm -hmm. a divine spirit comes down in the form of a hawk. Oh, wow, Jesus must have, this is a magical ritual. Jesus must have been practiced in Egyptian magic. But then you're like, wait a minute, that text comes from a fourth century papyrus. So literally, you know, 380 years after Jesus in late antique Greco, Greco Egyptian contexts, these magical papyri are not magical. Like the, 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 they're made by Egyptian priests in a temple setting. And these Egyptian priests aren't sitting there saying, Hey, I'm doing magic. Like they're doing literary work. And so you're, you're using like, uh, Egyptian priestly 
texts to make sense from the fourth century, really hundreds of years after Jesus, to try to make sense of first century, you know, devotional biography that we call the Gospels. And I just think that's really bad methodology. Like, let's, you know, going back to Justin's yeah. point, let's use other Galilean wonder workers as a way to understand the context, not fourth century Greco-Egyptian texts. Um, so that's that's another point where calling the even calling the Greek Greek magical papyri magic is kind of a category error because the, the Egyptian priests wouldn't have called it that because because of the polemical nature of the term. And that and that what you're saying is so important because it's so easy to get caught up in this type of methodology where we take two different texts from two different time periods, two different two different groups of people from different parts of the map. And we put them side by side and say, look, they're similar. So they must be, they must be connected somehow. And I used to do this all the time. And you see this a lot with mythicists. You see this a lot with other, uh, you know, like Roman provenance theory. You see this like time and time again. Well, you're finding one little sentence in Suetonius and compare that to one little sentence in Mark and say, look, we found a match. Oh, here it is. And that Paralomania, I think that's what they call that. that yeah. That's like that. It's very macro. There's no, we're not looking at the logistics of this. We're not looking at how it plays out. We're just looking at from like a huge bird's eye view and putting things together that don't necessarily match. Um, and, so I, that, and I could be, I could be convinced if there were, if there was more there, there, like if there's a specific Aramaic word that seems to be borrowed from a Egyptian priestly context, or if the bird was a, a hawk instead of a dove. And it uses a term that like sounds like Horus. Like there's there's ways where I've been like, okay, maybe whoever wrote this gospel might have known a thing or two about, you know, Egyptian uh, ritual practice. <laughs> but like w without that, it does strike me as parallel mania. Right, and also it's the fourth century text. It's more likely the carts yeah. before the horse. Uh, yeah, exactly that point too. Yeah. Now I have a question because Doctor Sledge, you brought up a really good point when you opened up. You were taught. You mentioned Honi the Circle. Uh, Honey the Circle Maker and Henny de Mendoza and another person as well. Can you give us any, some examples of these? Maybe one of them. Maybe Honey the Circle draw for some reason. Some people who don't know who that is, because you, you met the, the reason why I'm asking you this is because people like to put put Jesus in this category of completely uh, different than all, all the, than anyone else in this time period. He he was so unique, and he had to have this had to, this has to be something special. Can you give us an example of something like Honey Ben, uh, Anita, uh, sorry, Honey the Circle Drawer and his life and some of the things that he did? So we can we can kind of book in Jesus between several other of these uh, Anshe Maase, these doers of deeds. You know, Jesus is never called that in the Gospels, but I think he would have fit right in in some ways. Um, so Honey uh, Hamagail, the Honey the Circle Drawer, was famous for. Uh, drawing a circle around himself and demanding that God make it rain. And then when God did make it rain, uh, God made it rain too much. And Coney demanded that God make it rain less. Uh, this, own, this earned him a, a great deal of uh, ire among his rabbinical colleagues. Again, something like Jesus, someone that could do miracles, but also was uh, viewed with some skepticism by his colleagues. So that, that's, a, that's an interesting parallel also uh, in some versions of the story killed by the Romans. Um, so... What we have in that story, right, is a, a miracle worker. We have someone drawing a circle, which was a common magical practice in, in many parts of the world of, of the Eastern Mediterranean, and then basically making a demand on God, and particularly to make it rain, which was um, obviously tied to agricultural surplus and, and things like that. Chani de Mendoza was famous as an exorcist. In fact, he was so righteous that the text, uh, the Talmud uh, re relates that his wife became accustomed to miracles, that they just happened because he was so righteous uh, that she was like, oh, a miracle happened. Um, so he was very righteous in this way. He famously dealt with the queen of the, the demons, Agrat Bad Machalat. Um, and there's other miracles associated with him as well, including healings and things like that. Shimon Bar Yochai, uh, also um, living in the second century, was... Um, famous for uh, being so righteous that uh, lasers would shoot out of his eyes and incinerate anyone who uh, he looked at. So he had these kind of like powers like that. Um, uh, all of these guys were living. Uh, and again, Jesus sort of fits in the middle, right? Choni, the circle maker is a couple generations before. Shimon Bar Yochai is a couple generations after. Um, so they're all living in the same world, specifically the context of the Galilee, which you have to remember, the Galilee is actually cut off largely culturally and in some ways linguistically, so much so that Galilean Aramaic is a distinct kind of Aramaic compared to what they were speaking down there in, in, in Judea. They're cut off by the so-called Samaritan zone, that it is a culturally distinct area. Sometimes they're viewed as uh, kind of a rural, 
area full of bumpkins, the Amcha, the Amha Aretz. Uh, we might translate it as bumpkins or rednecks or something. Um, but these are all characters that are well attested in 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 um, in rabbinical literature. Of course, their stories get magnified as time goes on, right? And we shouldn't broadcast ideas from the Babylonian Talmud, which was written several centuries uh, uh, later, back onto the Mishnah. But even in the Mishnaic literature, which is edited around 200 of the Common Era, they're pretty contemporaneous with Jesus. So these are characters that I think that if a Galilean Jew who was roaming around with Jesus, I think they would have said, this guy's kind of like Choni, right? More of an apocalyptic bent, maybe, but they wouldn't have been terribly surprised by him. Uh, and I think they would have not been surprised by his ability to perform uh, miracles because that was a thing that was a social category that existed. Interesting. Anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I guess to, to parse between, I mean, this is one of the difficult things about trying to track down the historical Jesus and the Gospels. You know, some stuff, historians are broadly in agreement that it's historical. You know, Jesus was probably crucified by the Romans, probably baptized by John the Baptist. So when it comes to miracles, which are a category outside of empirical study, you know, we can't say he really walked on water. So I, I try to, when I think about the the plausibility of Jesus posturing as a, as a specialist, a, a ritual specialist of some sort. It's the exorcism aspect that seems most likely to me, um, partially because the accusation that he was driving out demons in the name of demons in the name of Beelzebul seems like something that would not have been invented. Like this might've been an actual insult hurled against him. Uh, and, and there's so much evidence that people were doing exorcisms. So we don't need to, agree that demons existed, but there's evidence that people were practicing exorcisms. Um, it's just the nature of what the exorcisms might have looked like. Was it just performative, where it's just on, you know, on stage, as it were, saying stuff, or was it a, a literate specialist situation? Um, some, some argue that exorcism was in the purview of literate specialists, and the idea that some layperson was going around being an exorcist is unlikely. I don't know if I agree with that, just because we see that today like you see it all throughout the human history that a charismatic enough person could claim to have powers over the demonic powers so um and, and it's worth mentioning that you know up, up to a third depending on how you count them up to a third of jesus's miracles were exorcisms um and there are seven famous ones well well and what's conspicuously missing is that there are, i think there are no exorcisms in the gospel of john it's it's a pe peculiar thing about about how the gospels get written down. Yeah. But I, I agree uh, with Andrew. I think that Jesus would have probably been mostly well known. The historical Jesus would have been primarily known as a, an apocalyptic preacher and an exorcist. Uh, there's a great study about a, a book called uh, Jesus the Galilean Exorcist, which is an excellent um, monograph. Really, um, I think by Amanda Weeks, I think is her name, uh, that really locates Jesus as an exorcist in the Galilean context in a very very um, mentioning other these miracle workers and stuff like that. It's an excellent monograph if you want to get into um, Jesus as a Galilean exorcist. And the ancient historian Ramsey McMullen makes an argument that Christianity itself grew because Christians claimed to have miraculous powers and specifically powers over demons. So mm -hmm. it kind of sparks this whole tradition of Christian exorcists. And right. you see this in the hagiographies, like the, the saints are always portrayed as contending with demons you know anthony the great is out there in the deserts of egypt just like r literally wrestling with demons and there's a, there's a plausible argument that people were brought to christianity they converted to christianity because like ah that guy down the street he can command demons i want to be on that guy's side so they weren't necessarily persuaded by the the the, the message of christianity they were persu persuaded by people that were positioning themselves as charismatic specialists that have control over demonic forces and to piggyback off that, Andrew, I think there's a good argument you made. That's the reason why Jews abandon exorcism. Uh, we see a ton of literature on exorcism in the Second Temple period. And then um, exorcisms drop off the map, basically, in Judaism. We see very little evidence of Jewish exorcisms happening basically after the after the third century, second and third centuries. Uh, they don't appear again in the literature, any Jewish literature, until the 16th century. So I think that's also the success of Christianity as an exercising religion I think part of how Christianity and Judaism parted ways is exactly on this exorcism line. I think the Jews more or less said in the divorce, you can have exorcisms. And Jews basically, I think, largely abandoned that as a technology for dealing with demons. They developed other technologies for dealing with demons. But particularly and, and exorcism is not attested in Jewish literature, basically uh, after the, the third century, second, the third or fourth century. Interesting. 
So I, I want to return to Morton Smith too, because we kind of dumped on him so much, but there, there, there is one thing that I do agree with him, which is that there's, there seems to be some sort of embarrassment if you read between between the lines in the the gospels about Jesus's miracles, he he interprets that embarrassment as oh Jesus must have been some sort of crass magician, and then that this was papered over and and made more holy and serene in later Christian literature. But if you read like the early layers, oh he must have been some sort of magician. We do see hints of that because in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has two saliva miracles where he uses spit. Mm. Um, I think it's in Mark chapter eight where he heals. A, a blind man he makes he, he brings his sight back by spitting and you know, putting spit on the guy's eyes and he it only half works He's like oh i can see but the people are walking around like trees and so jesus does it again and then it works and it doesn't appear in matthew and luke matthew and luke famously just copy and paste entire sections of mark right but they they delete the two spit miracles and when you look at in, in, into the first century context there are a few other mentions of spit being used as a healing uh, a healing substance. So Pliny the Elder, who's this famous Roman uh, geographer and scholar, talks about spit having healing powers. And there's another mention of, I think it's Vespasian, the emperor, like using Suetonius. Suetonius. Yeah. Suetonius mentions this. Yeah. So, so you know, I say the historical plausibility is that he was an exorcist, but he could have positioned himself as a healer too. But there's at least this these two stories in Mark, whether or not they go back to the historical Jesus, I don't know. But that th this story is kind of deleted out of the Christian tradition possibly out of embarrassment. It, Mark Goodacre, the New Testament scholar, thinks that uh, this was this was Matthew kind of scrubbing it from from his gospel. Yeah, and exorcist, good... exorcist and healer were never mutually exclusive. In fact, the dominant theory, one of the dominant theories of illness in the ancient Near East was possession. So they would have, you, you'd have gone to the same guy often. Yeah. yeah, yeah. so I use that word healing pretty loosely because you're 100% you're right. And we think of demons here in the 21st century, we think of something that's ethereal. Like if you were to put a demon on a scale, would it measure? And I think a lot of people today would say, well, no, even if you believe in demons, like, oh, no, they just have a different kind of substance. But in, in antiquity, like everything has substance. So demons would have had this airy substance. So when you think about demonic possession in that context and that ancient metaphysics you're it's it's a medical condition almost like you your your substance is being invaded by another substance and you got to draw that out so exorcism quite literally is like a medical procedure and i just want to touch on one thing before we end this great conversation is when we talk like you mentioned how you know think there's things that we don't, we know about jesus like he probably was crucified he probably was baptized certain things that you just don't make up they're just kind of very specific uh details about someone's life that probably happened but as far as the miracles go it, you made a good point because you mentioned how other other writers like pliny and suetonius are making these sort of stories with other other figures like vespasian for example but also with the lives of the philosophers by Di diogenes Laertius. he's making a, a lot of the stories about some of these philosophers are sound like miracle stories sound very you know like pythagoras playing music and then the animals are all coming up to him and he can talk to animals and learn their languages like really did that happen but it almost makes you wonder is this just how stories were told in the ancient world about great figures who they want to they want to survive they want these people to survive through generations you tell stories this way and that way people will you know uh you know uh celebrate these people what do you guys think about that I'll just say that, yes, I mean, that's, we still do that. Um, I mean, we still do that. I mean, your uncle catches a fish and, you know, it's, it starts off this big and, you know, by the three yeah. times later, it's, so we still do that. Um, but also to Andrew's point, right? The principle of embarrassment is a really powerful tool, I think, in the Gospels where we get these, uh, we get these uh, stories where Jesus heals someone. In some cases, he has to manually touch them. And then some guy, you know, by later text, he can just walk past their house and heal them. Uh, that principle of embarrassment, I think, is crucial to seeing the kinds of things that uh, that uh, that point us in the direction of the historical Jesus, because it's precisely the things you'd want to talk about him defeating death and leaving the grave or blah, 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 not him having to, you know, manually do anything uh, the way that you and I would have to, you know, uh, to use Andrew's example, you know, spit and mix it with mud. That's, that's not a godlike thing to do. So that right. principle of embarrassment is, a, I think, a powerful, not not exhaustive, but a powerful tool in that regard. Good point. Yeah. And and people ascribing miraculous, you know, thaumaturgical power to their their heroes is nothing special. Is nothing nothing surprising. You know, like Justin said, we see that happening today. You know, the Roman Catholic Church is still canonizing saints, and a lot of that means identifying them, doing miracles. So this is happening here in the 21st century. So that's why I'm a little bit more agnostic when I about like is Jesus 
uh, was he actually some sort of exorcist? You know, I'm pretty sure he was an apocalyptic preacher, but are the exorcism stories rooted in some sort of history? Maybe. I think it's very plausible because it's just a very common social role in antiquity. Um, but because we're dealing with these supernatural things that can't be empirically ver verified, it just automatically puts it in a different category of more difficult to establish historically. Yeah, very I think I would be surprised if he weren't. I guess that's my position is that right. they're just so they're kind of a dime a dozen. I, I think that like every village had a had some ritual expert that dealt with illness. And unless you were highly trained Galenic doctor or something, and those would have been in the urban areas, I think you had everyone gets sick. Everyone has, you know, if your dominant dominant theory of illness in many parts of the world still to this day is is some kind of demonic influence. It just would strike me as very strange if there were just weren't an army of these of these ritual experts all over the world, not just in the Galilee. And some of them really made it into history, but the, the, the vast majority of them didn't that Jesus did exorcisms or didn't. It'd be weird to me if he, if he, if he didn't, I suppose, I, I guess that's the, the way it jumps out to me is that, um, we think of exorcisms as being a really weird anomalous thing that you make movies about because they're so weird. I think exorcisms would have been like, yeah, you know, my daughter has dropsy or whatever. I think it's like, yeah, I'm going to the exorcist. I got to take my kid to the exorcist. Like the same way we'd say, I take my kid to the pediatrician. I'm, I've got to take my kid to the exorcist. I, I think that I think that that we have to put ourselves not in our shoes, but put ourselves in their shoes. And I think that the that these villages, they they it was a it was a it was a role. It was a social role. And it just popped in my head just now because we were talking about the we we're talking about Parmenides before we went lot before we hit the record, and in the Peter Kingsley book where he talks about how the Parmenides movement had this ritual of incubation to heal people and they would go in these deep sleep incubation techniques and they would meet Asclepius or Apollo and then be healed. I wonder if that sort of is kind of what we're getting at when, when we talk about this being called magic or, 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 or um, casting out demons, but this is just another way of that. What do you think? Is that, what do you think? I mean, I don't know about the, first century Judean and Galilean context, but incubation continues into Christianity. Like it's mm. a, it's a practice that doesn't go away. So Saint incubation shrines are a dime a dozen in the Eastern Mediterranean, at least there's, there's one in Asia minor called the, the shrine of the seven sleepers. So the seven sleepers are these, these Christian saints that, you know, are fam They famously go to sleep. <laughs> and I, I believe they like, they sleep for like a, rip van winkle kind of long period of time yeah. and so this 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 shrine becomes an incubation shrine where where you have little alcoves where people slept so you can imagine it was maybe like a hostel or a dormitory and the 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 uh saints would visit you in your dreams and heal you so wow. you know i don't think we see that i mean we don't see hints of that in the go gospels at all so i have no idea if we can apply that to you know the jesus movement in the first century but definitely is a major part of the cult of the saints in the third fourth fifth centuries yeah, it exists in judaism now too um it's a, it's a re more recent kabbalistic thing but um wow it exists in, in in kabbalah as well but again this is just pointing to the fact that there are lots of technique there are lots of ways to get sick and there are lots of ways that people de to develop technologies to to get well and uh we have to think of healing as a technology just like we have MRIs and various things now, obviously we use evidence-based medicine now, but they they also use their version of evidence-based medicine, and there were a, a myriad of uh, of technologies of, of which incubation, exorcism, are are just you know uh, just some of the few. In fact, Egypt's sort of unusual in the fact that it was actually um, much more uh, pharmaceutical in its in its medical practices as opposed to, for instance, Mesopotamia, which is much more uh, on the exorcism train. Fascinating. And uh, Dr. Henry, any any final thoughts on this? And maybe if you want to bring it back to maybe what Morton Smith, uh, what to look out for that Morton Smith was doing that you don't disagree with. Yeah, so I guess I would just say, be sharp with your theory and be sharp with your method. So theory is, is intellectual self-defense. So you're not using a term unreflectively. What, what do you mean by religion? What do you mean by magic? What do you mean by exorcism? You know, even even that term, we think of, you know, getting a demon out of you, but sometimes people use exorcism as like protective warding away, you know, keeping a demon away from you. So like every single term we use it carries with it assumptions. So 
when you read a book like Morton Smith and he says Jesus is a magician, you have to say, well, what does he mean by that? So theory is often the most boring part of a theory of method class. It's usually very difficult, mm -hmm. but it's like absolutely necessary. And then just be careful with your methodology. Like, are you applying a fourth century Greco-Egyptian text to a first century Jewish Galilean preacher? That's just, that's just bad history. Mm, good point. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Sledge, any last thoughts on this as well? I guess I would, you know, just to really to piggyback on what Andrew said, is that um, if you have a text coming out of a, a specific in a specific historical context, um, pay attention to that context, right? Like, if you're reading about Galilean Jews of the second century, go read what other Galilean Jews of the second century were up to. We re we really heavily over, I think, overweight in some ways uh, the conversation uh, in the direction of uh, the Hellenistic world, as opposed to Jewish conversations and Jewish technical language and, and and what Jews were up to at that time. Uh, and not that Jews are one homogenous group either at that time. Definitely not. <laughs> um, but I think that um, by, I think by adjusting that focus, I think we'll, we'll better understand Jesus, the Galilean Jew, um, because I mean, that's, that's what he was. Thank you for that. Also, links for both of their channels are in the description. Esoterica and Religion for Breakfast, two of the best channels out there. And check out their Patreons as well. I support both of them. I think it's something that we should support because, you know, this you, you're not going to find this anywhere besides what you two are, where you two are. So I want to throw that out there as well. And you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jeez.